Jeudi 20 mai 2021, journée exceptionnelle sur la CRTV. À 8h30, l'unité nationale en fanfare. Des rythmes et des symphonies jouées par les forces de défense. À 11h, la messe de la nation. À 13h30, une édition spéciale du journal télévisé bilingue. À 2 p.m., Saving Bango, your afternoon movie. À 16h30, Eric Christian est votre guide pour en... Who have given the country an identity. Men and women who have shaped the Cameroonian way of life. Men and women who still have their own way and philosophy of seeing how the country should move forward as we all move towards emergence by 2035. One of them has been Cameroon's ambassador first to Canada and then High Commissioner when the country became a member of the Commonwealth in 1995. But proud to becoming all of that, he was a member of government and he hails from the Northwest region of what is today. He also holds the record as the longest seven prime minister in the history of the country, from the days of Indili to the days of Foncha to the days of Peter Mafani Musonge. Now he serves the country as the Grand Chancellor of National Orders. With him, we understand how Cameroon has evolved in the past 16 years, the event he has lived, and how he has played a key role in his own way in such occurrences. Philip Mouya, thank you very much for exclusively talking to the CRTV today. Thank you, sir. You were born in 1947, just two years before the creation of... 1947, in a place called Jigidemoku. We didn't have roads in Jigidemoku at the time. And I went to the local primary school in Jigidem, a Baptist mission school. And uh, I went up with my senior brother to a place called Wowo in Donga Mountain, where I spent a year in primary school. Then I returned to uh, Oku and went to a school they called the Cameroon Baptist Mission School in Elak, Oku. And that was 14 miles away, 14 kilometers away from my village. So for three years, I trekked seven kilometers to school and seven kilometers back home. That's the total of 14 kilometers every day. And I never missed school even for one day because my father wouldn't tolerate that. Who was your father? From a family of how many people in particular? How, who was mom? Mom? What well, were they doing in those days? No, a big, uh, a big uh, polygamous family. But my mother died when I was nine, so by that time I was... Uh, And as you were going to school in primary school, like you indicated, now you are grown up. Who were some of your class, primary school classmates? Uh, most of my primary school mates uh, didn't go far. I was, uh, I went to secondary school from Oku, and we are the first persons to go to secondary school at least. What I know, the two of us to CPC Bali, the Moon Protestant College Bali. But my cousin didn't finish. He left in from three because his father couldn't uh, pay the fees. So I am in many ways, I guess, the first person from Oko to finish secondary school. That is quite historic. And how do you feel holding that record? Well, <laughs> it was just a question of circumstances. I mean, there were many kids who could have gone to secondary school, but their parents couldn't afford that. And my father could afford it because he was determined to give me a good education. And not only was he determined, but he always told me, yes, Peter Isoka was in Form 5 when I was in Form 1, so I know him well. 
Dr. Wete was in Form 5. That's uh, Peter Izoka's classmate. Uh, you mean the former Deputy Director General of CRT? Absolutely, sir. So those were the people I uh, knew in school. But we have people like uh, my the former Chancellor of the University, Vice Chancellor of the University of Buya, Mr. Titanji. Another one was Mr. Lambi. And uh, those are the people with whom I was. And uh, Mr. Guanyala, who was Director General of Customs at one time. Oh, I, I think at the time the post didn't carry the title Director General, but he was Director of Customs. Okay. And uh, those are the people I can remember immediately. But the, uh, from CPC Valley, we have quite some people around. What could your parents provide to you people in those days in school, for example? Today, when children go to school, you have boxes, you have chocolates. In those days, when uh, you were told that you were going to a missionary school where you have to stay alone, what, what constituted your bag? What was inside the bag? Well, uh, in uh, Cameroon Protestant College, that was... Uh, that was secondary school? Yes. Which year did you enter into secondary school? 1962. 1962? January 62. 62. Because at that time, the school year started in January, mm -hmm. not like now in September. Mm -hmm. And uh, the school system changed while we were in secondary school. Mm -hmm. uh, when the school year would start in September, but at the beginning in 1962, it was January. Mm -hmm. And I must tell you this is significant because uh, the year I finished Standard 6, that was the year there was a referendum. You mean the plebiscite? It was on the 11th of February, which I remember very well. Because before then, I in fact read at the propaganda of Funchal's party and the propaganda of NLS party and explained it to my father, my uncles, and other people. Our house was always a meeting place where people would come and then they would be informed on what would happen. And effectively, my father was pretty active and on that day, on the 11th of February, he was the representative of the village at the polling station. I didn't vote, I was still a kid, but we knew what was happening. And uh, from the but like seven years, which followed after. <laughs> yes. So we had a, a, a wonderful time because people were very excited about the referendum about the plebiscite. Well, it was an important choice, a historical choice. And many people had had an opportunity to travel to Nigeria. For instance, my father, when he was a young man, trek to Nigeria, the sold colonists, they went to Sokoto, Yola, all those places. Not here alone, but with lots of people. And then they had a choice. And many of the people in my village were for reunification with the Republic of Cameroon. Many of them were pretty excited about being with their brothers in Fumba because they thought Fumba had gone very far and that if they were part of the Republic of Cameroon, they would be lucky to. You were in Oku in those days in 1961, as you say, in that portion of the Northwest of today, which was then uh, British Saudi Cameroon. Now, the day of the 1961 UN organized and supervised a referendum yeah. in your area. Was it rainy? Was it sunny? Was no, it just no, a normal? How do you remember the day on February? Beautiful day. February is dry and you can go to any place and uh, people enjoy themselves. They are at ease. There isn't rain and you don't need an umbrella. <laughs> Were you two stories that maybe in the other portions of Cameroon it was raining and was you read the manifesto like you just said yes. and explained it to the family um, what was actually uh, not happening only to the family to lots of people to because lots of people and their friends. Uh, our uh, compound especially my father's house was almost always a meeting place and uh, at the time he was the chairman of the local local council a council which went on which was involved in the governance of Oku every day because they met once every week. So that was like a meeting place and uh, uh, we knew a lot of things about reunification. Okay. I mean, I was a child, I wouldn't decide that 
I read the propaganda. It was in marvelous English, very simple English. You didn't need a dictionary. So that is what happened at that time. And what is also interesting is that the people saw the plebiscite or the referendum as an opportunity to make a crucial choice between Nigeria and Cameroon. They had traveled to Nigeria, they had gone to places, they had been involved in traveling to places like Bamenda, seeing what a lot of the Nigerians did, and they also imagining what they would have if they went back to their brothers. Because they were also told, which is true, that historically, Cameroon was one. So they were, they were being told of when Cameroon was in the German protectorate from 1884 to 1916 when they were chased because of World War I, followed by the um, Anglo-French condominium, which did not succeed, and then yeah. followed by the League of Nations uh, mandate system, which of course was replaced by the United Nations trusteeship in 1946. Um, there is this book by Victor T. Lovin, Cameroon from Mandate to um, Independence. And while all of this was going on, 1961, like you said, you went to secondary school. I just wonder where you did your university. Yaoundé, the federal university at the time? Yes, Levine, I remember meeting him. He came once to the University of Yaoundé and gave a lecture. Uh. He's an American who knew a lot about Cameroon. Uh. Well, I went to Cameroon Protestant College, Bali. Afterwards, I went to CAST, which was the only place you could go and get A-levels in the former West Cameroon. So after that, I entered the University of Yaoundé. There was only one university, the Federal University of Cameroon. And I entered the law faculty. That's where I studied. And I did so because Back in 1962, when I was in Form 1, my father said he wanted me to be a magistrate. Because if he had ever gone to school, he would have been a magistrate. So the choice was made. And I didn't have time to argue with him. So I came to Yahoo. It was not a democratic world, like, like that of today. No. Uh, <laughs> my father didn't practice democracy when it concerned me. <laughs> <laughs> the decisions were taken beforehand. <laughs> well, and I laugh over that because I think the decision was right. He was intelligent, but I knew nothing and I followed his advice. How, how did you study in the Federal University uh, in the 1960s, late 1960s, uh, getting to 70s, um, where most people were complaining that the main language of instruction in most courses was in French. How did you cope in that environment? Bilingualism was just being constructed in those days with Ben at Forlong and others. Yes, it's a question of background. I went to CPC Bali, where we were extremely lucky. We were taught French by French men and taught English by American Peace Corps volunteers. So we had French teachers who never spoke English. Peace Corps, since their institu institution, 1961, by President Kennedy. 62, sir. 62. That's the first team that came. Th the first team that came in 1962? Yes. OK. So we were taught French by French men. I remember Henri Bertrand, who was our teacher. And uh, he taught us French with a lot of patience. He never spoke a word of English. So we already had an advantage. Okay. And coming to the University of Yaoundé, we had had other teachers, like teachers from Switzerland, who made us understand the language. It's only an issue if you make it an issue. Because learning a new language is like walking through a new door into a new civilization. It only makes you greater. And so I never thought French would be a problem, and I never made it, made it a problem. And I would say so, that's part of uh, the past, because I graduated probably with the highest mark from the law faculty. 
What was the GPA? What we call today GPA? What was the ranking by then? Well, I don't know, but I think he was the highest mark. Okay. Uh, either the highest or second highest, but I think he was a very good mark. Okay. Then I went to Enam. Mm -hmm. There was no section for Anglophones in Enam, and I went into the Francophone section. And I graduated topping the class of Magister Francophone. That, that was in which year? 74 now, sir. 1974. 1974. 1974. You the records are there, sir. I, I, I don't dispute your record. I just want our audience to, to follow the trajectory together. 1974, of course. 1972, we have had the referendum which transformed the state from the 10-year, 10 10-month 10 federal experience to a unitary state. How yes. was 1972? Where were you? What were you doing when those uh, great mutations? Well, in 72, I was already uh, in my mid-twenties. I was getting to be 25, not yet 25. And having been a student in the University of Yaoundé, we were very, very well informed about the world and about this country. Uh, we had a lot of our French teachers who were people who introduced us to the world. The dean of the law faculty was called Pierre Vergniaud. You couldn't spend two hours, three hours with Vergniaud and not want to be a law student. So Was he when, a Frenchman? Yes. Okay. Not only a Frenchman, but a real Frenchman who had ideas about the world mm -hmm. and he wanted his students to do well in mm -hmm. the world. Okay. So when uh, President Heiju made the speech, declaring that there would be a referendum. May 6, 1972. Yes, sir. And also stating that the referendum would be on the 20th May. For us students. By then, the National Assembly was made up of 120 members. Yes, because that was the Federal Assembly. Sure. But in addition to that, you had the West an assembly Cameroon, in e the West Cameroon, the East Cameroon exactly. uh, Assembly Plus. The, the West the Cameroonian Police Force, West Cameroonian Public service, service, East Cameroon Public, public service, service, Federal Public service. service. There was a lot of confusion and a lot of conflicts. And being law students, we knew a lot about that. And we celebrated this. We either a country or we not a country. Are we small bits of the same uh, ensemble? Now the U.S. Constitution says a pluribus unum. Meaning? One out of many. Okay. Or out of many, one. One. That's what a nation should be. Okay. It shouldn't be pieces thrown all over the place. Okay. Villages, yes. But when once you talk of a nation, it should Chief be Dons, a nation. yes. Languages, yes. Tribes, yes. Germany started with tribes. Yeah. Most nations which are nations today started as villages and as, uh, as small tribes. Then they came to be one. So historically, in our constitutional history, we were moving from the federal state to the unitary state. And we welcome that because... Former West Cameroon had a lot of difficulty and a lot of the civil servants were unhappy because they were not paid the same salaries as the federal civil servants. And we were happy that everybody would earn the same salary. That everybody was put on the same scale. Absolutely. And that when we graduated, we would not have to be arguing whether we work for West Cameroon, for East Cameroon, or the federal government. So that was something which people celebrated. And people were happy about that. Did and you we vote saw in, that as Did you vote in 1972? Absolutely, re sir. Re 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 uh, referendum. And where were you in particular? Where did you cast your vote? Well, in Yaoundé. In I was a student in Yaoundé. You were a student in Yaoundé. And, uh, well, and uh, I would point out to you that I have... I first came to Yaoundé in 1968 as a law student to sure. register in the law faculty. Uh -huh. This year was, this country was hardly eight years old. Uh -huh. And so I voted here. For us, there was no problem. 
And we saw this as a contribution to the history of this country to be able to cast a vote that would determine the future of our country. Uh, you did cast your vote, and much of what you were talking about, the amalgamation of the Federal uh, Republic to a unitary state can be found in Cameroon from federal to a unitary state, a critical study uh, edited by Professor Julius Victor Ngo, amongst others, Professor Ibune, uh, Ka, others, lecturers of the University of Yaoundé, a group of Cameroonian historians. Um, you talked of 1968, I presume is the same year uh, the current head of state became Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic, cumulative with his functions of director of the civil I think so, yeah. the civil cabinet of the presidency yes. of the republic um you were barely getting to 30s uh late 20s and in 1975 you entered the government tell me that experience of 1975 when i entered the government the country was still very young and it was uh, roughly 15 years old and the day i was appointed vice minister 30th june I was 28 years, two weeks. So that's 1975. Vice Minister for Territorial Administration? Yes. Who was I your had, boss then? I had already worked in Buya as a... As a prosecutor? Yes, at the for court of five appeals. months. For five months, at the Court yes. of Appeals. Who was your well, boss then? We, we worked at the legal department, so we dealt with the Magistrates Court, the High Court, and the Court of Appeal. Because there were very few people in the magistracy then. Uh. I can tell you in Buya there were hardly six or seven of us. Uh. And my boss then was, interim boss, was George Guan Monsieur. Uh -huh. And then the boss who returned from Britain, who had gone for studies, was Mr. Nyo Wakai okay. of uh, blessed memory. Uh. But George Guan Monsieur is here in Yaoundé. Uh. He is now retired. I know him so well. He used to be Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice. Sure. sure. And formerly Director of uh, Military Justice. I know him so well. So I worked under him. And uh, then mistaken, under Mr. Wakai. If I'm, Wakai if for I'm five not months. mistaken, the wife used to be Minister for uh, Supreme State Audit. Yes, she was the first magistrate before whom I appeared and argued a case, uh -huh. which is quite a thing for a young man uh -huh. to go before a court with a case and argue the case and come out of the court feeling that you've done your first a court appearance where you are on your own. Okay, you entered the government in 1975. Yes. That should be the first unitary government, right? No. There was a unitary government in 1972. I mean with Paul Bia as prime minister. Because he became prime minister in yes. 1975. Yes, but let me explain, sir. Okay, sir. There was a unitary government in 72, the sure. year of the election. Absolutely. There was a government uh -huh. which was in many ways like an interim government uh -huh. waiting for a number of things to be put in place. Yeah. Yes, then effectively in 75, there was a government where President Paul Bia became prime minister. And I was in that government as vice minister. Of territorial administration. Yeah. And my Minister of State, my immediate boss, was Minister of State Ayisi Mbodo. Victor? Yes. So I worked there for four years and about three months and became Minister for Mines and Energy. I was 32. 32? Yes. Minister of Mines and Energy. Which was quite an interesting experience because my youngest director or technical advisor was 45. 45? Yes. At that age, when you are given such post of responsibilities with the kind of education you received from your dad, how could you manage an entire ministry with people older than you at that time? I mean, 1975 is not today. Yes, uh, it's an interesting question. Thank you for the question. But before becoming a Minister for Mines and Energy, I spent four years as Vice Minister of Territorial Administration. That was in itself a solid, a solid training for me. Uh, because nothing, sir, trains anybody to be a minister. You have to be in the position of a minister to know what a minister does. Because there are complications, and then you have to take decisions. 
where you take responsibility, if it's right, fine. You go along, you pay the price. Uh, how did it look like to sit in the same room as a minister and year President Amadou Ayi in those days? Well, uh, in the ministerial meeting? Well, you were already uh, in government, and uh, there were relatively few people in government in those days. And uh, being in government was like being in school, because you had to learn all the time. This is not a new thing. You see the big industries, if you were to go to Microsoft, you go to the State Department, you go to Harvard and you meet a responsible person there, you go to the University of London, or Sorbonne, you begin by learning. If you don't learn, you are dying. Uh, there is a management guru who said that, Peter Drucker, who said if you stop learning, you are dying. So even a young person has to learn. Older people have to keep learning. If you don't learn, you become useless to the system. So it meant we had to be all learning. And by the way, at that time there was nobody who claimed to know everything. This is 75. This country was only 15 years old. You didn't have all the university professors, all the graduates, and we didn't have a lot of people with a lot of experience as we have now. Even the people who were civil servants at independence in 1960 or 61 with reunification were for the most part fairly young people. Accepted. Uh, another question I would like to put to you is when you were Vice Minister of Territorial Administration, later Minister of Mines and Energy, in the 1970s to 80s, which were the most pressing um, energy issues the country was facing. Which, which, what were your priorities, the key elements which were recurrent on your table, that this is the country's most urgent electricity uh, trouble? Well, at the time, the only, uh, when I entered the Ministry of uh, Mines and Energy, the only uh, source of energy, the main source of energy, hydroelectricity, was the Ilea Dam. For you, Involving its construction process, no, the minister, no. you that meant was, it already constructed? That was built a long time before, I think in the mid-50s. Yeah. While I was minister, eventually, they built Songlulu. Uh -huh. uh, around that time before, they had built uh, um, Bamenjing, uh -huh. which is a retention dam. It doesn't produce electricity. Sure. So there were the energy needs, which were very important, and for a developing economy, you absolutely need to have a sure source of energy. Uh. You know, look around, almost everything is based on energy. Uh. If your source of energy isn't a good one, you're not going to go far. Is there but any at project? the same time, we were already looking into things like... Uh, is, is there a project, when you were Minister of Energy, that you piloted, which today serves uh, the nation greatly, maybe in terms of water or uh, electricity, I don't know, or the mining oh, yes. sector? Oh yes, I mean the main project then was Songlulu uh -huh. and uh, the present uh, president of the Senate was Director General of Sonel. Uh -huh. So I remember working years with him and uh, for the other things like water, we had SNEC which was building water systems. They didn't build them but they exploited them. But we got a lot of loans from elsewhere to build water projects here and there. Mm -hmm. And they were being built all over the country at the time. Okay. Uh, th there is a picture behind you. Uh, in that picture, there is uh, you as Minister of uh, Mines and Energy. There is Adamu Damjoya. And there is Dr. Kutu Philip. Who yes. were who were those people to you in the 1970s, 80s? Well, um, Mr. Ndamjoya, effective at the time, was in government. He was a minister. In fact, we entered uh, government the same day. He was vice minister of uh, foreign affairs, and I was vice minister of territorial administration. And he had been my examiner at the university. 
So somehow we became fairly good friends. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of coincidence. In the same government, there was also a uh, late Dr. Moni, who had been my teacher. Moni Koso? No, no, no. John Kengo Moni. Okay. Minister of Transport. Okay. So I, I knew some people from the university, mm -hmm. and I got along very well with Mr. Damjoya. He was uh, first minister of, vice minister of foreign affairs, later on minister of education. National education in those days? Yes, and I think here we were in a private party. Mm. The gentleman, the call a doctor, was working uh, at the time, I think, for Mr. Foshive. Mm. And uh, Mr. Ndamjoya was in government, so we were at a party. We were at the home of some friend, okay. I think in Valid Lamo. Oh, okay. Most uh, Yaoundé city dwellers know that today. Yes. Let, let me fast forward the discussion and land in 1982. Uh, you were part of the cabinet with President Amadou Ahijo. Yes. Were you people informed that he was going to resign? And why, why he was going to resign? He was going to hand power to the constitutional successor, Paul Beer. 1982. I was sitting in my office in the Ministry of Mines and Energy, and I got a call from the Secretary of Minister of State, Samuel Ibua. And she said, come for a ministerial meeting at 6 p.m. And I said to her, to him? Minister, no, to her, Secretary of Minister Ibua. OK, the Secretary of Minister Ibua, yeah. I said, ministerial meeting, she said yes. And I said, that's unusual. I don't have a dossier for that. You mean on, that should be November 4, right? Thursday, November 4. OK. So she said, no, there is a meeting, and you don't need a dossier. So we went to the presidency, to the new presidency. The Unity Palace? Yes, because before then, we used to have the ministerial meetings in the old a presidency. Which is today the National Museum. Absolutely. So we went to the presidency and when we arrived there, there were people in the meeting room. So we waited outside. And after some time, we were kept asking each other, I remember, what is the problem? Some we guesswork. Have a fight. <laughs> no, but no one had the idea of what was going on. idea of what would happen. So a team left there. That is the CNU, uh -huh. Central Committee. Uh -huh. The Politburo of the CNU. Yes, and I noticed, which was unusual, that a lady was crying. So I asked myself, what must it be about? But immediately they left, we came in. Who was that lady crying? Uh, I don't remember the name, I would think of the name, but I know there was a lady crying. Uh -huh. So we went into the cabinet room, the room where we usually had ministerial meetings, and the president came in and said, I have decided to resign. My health is not very good, and I will be going away and the constitutional successor is going to take over on Saturday. So the, ref the resignation becomes effective Saturday. And so he said, but he's decided with the Central Committee of the CNU that the Prime Minister would also be in charge of the party while he's away. And then he thanked us for having accepted to work in his government. Because if you were not for us, he couldn't have done the things he did. And then thanked us, we stood up, and he shook hands with everybody. What did he tell you in particular if there was any conversation? No, he shook hands with me. Uh, I mean, uh, there was, there no, was no special conversation, before but that, he shook hands with me. Before that, had you known President Paul Bia, maybe privately in discussions, as Prime Minister or, being, or Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic? 
No, not as Secretary General of the Presidency, but two days, because I was appointed uh, Vice Minister on the 30th of June, 1975. And coincidentally, I was appointed Prime Minister on the 30th of June, 2009. <laughs> Somebody did ask me, and I said I didn't think there was anything particular about the thing. <laughs> so you are just telling me not to ask that question? <laughs> well, because I can't answer, I don't think there is an answer. Okay. So I met him, I was, I met him on Saturday, the 28th of June. I came from Buya on his instruction. And I went to his home, which is opposite Gagnizo. That's where he lived. I later on lived in that house. So I came... Which is today the official residence of the Deputy Secretary General to the Presidency. I think so. So I came there, and he received me, and he was very nice to me, and he served me a Coca-Cola, and we conversed for, I think it must have been something like two hours. Ah. And afterwards, he was very nice and uh, drove me to Hotel du Député. Ah. He drove you? Yes. Okay. He was very nice. Okay. And he, we entered at 504 Black. Ah. I remember that very well. And he was the driver, the only two of us in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so he took me to Hotel de Député and left me there. He went away, came back, and had a short meeting with me. Then I stayed there. The following day, I returned to Buya. And uh, on the 30th of June, I was made vice minister. OK. Now let's talk, uh, the new president came to office, the new enthusiasm. Um, from 1984 to 2004, you first served as Cameroon's ambassador to Canada, where you equally studied in Ottawa, if my research is correct. Um, yes, I have a master's degree in law, in international law from the University of Ottawa, okay. Faculty of Law. Okay. And when Cameroon joined the Commonwealth as the 52nd member uh, during the Auckland New Zealand Summit in November 1995, the status changed to that of High Commissioner. What does it look like to preside a National Day ceremony in a foreign land? What is the feeling? Well, in a foreign land, the uh, responsibility of the ambassador is very important in a foreign land because it's the incarnation of the nation in that foreign land. Whatever the ambassador is, if he takes his responsibility seriously, the 20th of May is a big celebration because it's the day when he makes propaganda for his country in silence. He receives people. There is a reception given, mm. and people come to the reception and uh, see what Cameroon is like. What is the experience, for example, of mobilizing the Cameroonian diaspora of where you are? For example, the case of Canada, how does it look like? How do you get in contact with the various associations? Okay, in, in Canada it was pretty simple because the various associations had a direct link with us, and uh, they usually worked w with us very well. We didn't have a problem with them. For your 20 years stay in Canada in a bilingual country, using English and French as their official languages, unique only to Cameroon too, um, what is the best life lesson that you learned in Canada that you think uh, it's good for Cameroon? Well, uh, Canada I don't want to make propaganda for Canada, but I found Canada to be a very good country because the Canadian system is fairly balanced, partly American, partly European. 
So they are a kind of synthesis. So if you encounter that and you observe and you will learn a lot of things. So uh, it was a nice time to be there. They have very good schools, culturally they're very good, and they embraced multiculturalism very early. Mm. Under Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. The, the, the father of the current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Absolutely. Um, let's talk another element. Uh, when you left Canada, you came back here as uh, Deputy Secretary General to the President of the Republic. When you are Deputy Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic, what actually is your duty? Well, the title, the full title, and I think it's important to give the full title, is Minister Assistant Secretary General. It means you are a minister. It means you are, have the rank of minister and uh, you are working with the Secretary General. And working with the Secretary General means that you are If constantly I were to use the Canadian or the American model or the British model, it should be Deputy Chief of Staff, right? Yes. Is that correct to translate it that Absolutely. way? Absolutely. Okay. Well, it means that you are involved directly in the administration of the presidency because all the files that come to the Secretariat General, uh, there were two of us. There was me and there was Minister uh, Sadi. So we looked at the files. There was some form of rough division but it didn't mean that it was very strict and many files would come to us and the ones we thought we could handle directly, we did. If we thought we had to send them up to the Secretary General, it went up to them. And the notes which would come to us, or the dossiers, the files, if they were meant for the President, they would go from us to the Secretary General, then to the President. June 30, 2009, you were appointed Prime Minister, and, there, and if there is any decree of a Prime Minister appointed, which is in my house, is uh, that which appointed you, I've kept it in a folder, and I cannot okay. explain, just like I can't explain why you appointed Prime Minister <laughs> in 19, on June 30th, 1975, uh, uh, sorry, Deputy Minister on June 30th, 1975, and Prime Minister on June 30th, 2009. And nine. But somebody whispered to me that in one of his trips abroad, the president at one moment stopped in Canada and may have told you that um, Philemon Young, look, one day I will make you my prime minister. Uh, if it is not confidential, is that rumor correct or is no, it fake news? No. Those meetings were meant for conversations mm -hmm. where I would talk to him about my work mm -hmm. and he would give me a piece of advice. Mm -hmm. And if there were questions, he asked me, I would work on them. Mm -hmm. And he would give me directives. Okay. It could be in Canada if he stopped in Uganda airport, a technical stopover. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be in New York because when he would go to New York, very often I also went to New York. Mm -hmm. And he would receive me, give me instructions, ask me questions about my work. Mm -hmm. But no, uh, he never told me I'd be Prime Minister. Okay, no. so we'll <laughs> consider that fake news. Absolutely fake news. Okay. For nine years plus, for te you are the longest serving prime minister in the history. Nine years, six months, and four days. And four days, like you said during the day you were handing to John Gute. Yes. Um, when you are prime minister, what is the responsibility in a country well, like Cameroon? Like Cameroon, uh, in Limine, on entry, I like to say that nothing prepares anybody to be a prime minister of a complex country like we are. So you become prime minister and you get organized so that you can deal with all the complications. Uh, what do you do as a prime minister? Anything that the president gives you, you do, in addition to what is in the constitution. How many files could, can the prime minister of Cameroon read in a day? You have about 30 ministers or 40 to supervise, ministers of states, um, uh, state ministers, uh, ministers with portfolio, ministers without portfolios, secretaries of state. When you were prime minister, how many files could you read in a day? I wouldn't give that a number because uh, it's a bit difficult and there are files and files. There are files you can look through within 10 minutes, you know everything in there. 
But there are files which might require an hour or two hours. Or even in those two hours, you're unable to, to complete what you're doing. And then the uh, files which are dealing with issues coming from ministers, with issues coming from the presidency, and with internal issues or files within the prime minister's office. Mm. So you, your work is not limited. There are all kinds of things you must do. And you'll be receiving people on the instructions of the head of state. Mm. It could be diplomats, there could be invoices from another country. Mm. And you sometimes have to leave those files and travel abroad on behalf of the head of state, uh, or go to a ceremony on behalf of the head of state. Which you did on several occasions. But let me talk an quite issue. Quite often, I would quite say. Quite often. But let me talk an issue which most Cameroonians would like to know. Yes. Uh, each time the president does um, um, a cabinet reshuffle or the composition of the government, yes. it is always read that uh, based on the proposal of the prime minister. Yes. Out of 40 ministers that can be found in the government, how many, for example, does the prime minister propose? All of them? I didn't think that's very unfair because there's a head of state who is also elected by the population of this country. Mm -hmm. And he works with his prime minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, before he has a government, he has a signs a decree uh, appointing the government. A lot of he has had several conversations with the prime minister. And the uh, government is not formed in a day. Oh, okay. uh, because uh, people who work in government, the president is free to ask the prime minister, what do you think of this? And the prime minister can talk to the president about the performance of the ministers. Okay. I mean, this is a very well organized country. Okay. 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 So the details are unnecessary because conversations a prime minister has with the uh, president are privileged. Okay. Let me ask you this question too. You were a minister at the age of 28. When yeah. you were proposing to the president to appoint ministers as prime minister, did you ever in your mind at one moment say that, okay, I was minister at the age of 28, let us create another record. I will propose a young man of, let me say, 26 years to be prime minister or 25. Did that ever happen in your mind? I think I, I wouldn't because by the time I was prime minister, I was far more mature. And every country evolves with the circumstances. Uh, today, I think this country is by far more complicated than it was in 1975. And uh, the issues are by far more complicated. So the idea of just appointing people to make sense or to please uh, young people, I don't think that would be fundamentally a good thing. They should be appointed because they can handle the responsibility and do it well. Competence. And I would tell you, sir, if you're going to look for a surgeon to go into the theater, does the age count? You're looking more for the most experienced surgeon that can bring health to the people who will be taken into the theater. I like your medical analogy. Uh, we'll be coming to an end very soon. The last question as Prime Minister. There are so many fires you handled, Kameku, um, the relaunch of the economy after the structural adjustment program and the heavily indebted poor countries initiative. What was the most difficult file you had to manage as prime minister of this country? The start of the troubles in the northwest and southwest regions of the country? There were many difficult files because a young country definitely has issues which are complex. That was one of the files that was difficult. And uh, I understand why it is difficult. Because these are files which have economic issues. People might talk of assimilation. They might talk of marginalization. In there, there are all kinds of things. But fundamentally, there is almost always an issue of identity. You know, the French Revolution was about many things, but fundamentally about identity. The civil rights movement in the U.S. was fundamentally about identity. There's a time people begin to ask questions like, who am I really? It would happen in a country even if you didn't have bilingualism. It happens in countries which are all uh, homogeneous. It would happen in countries which like are Sudan heterogeneous. And Absolutely. Somalia. So you know, uh, that was a complex problem. And it's a problem which remains complex because it verges over into issues of diversity. 
okay. which are not easy to handle in any part of the world. Finally, how do you see your job today as a Grand Chancellor of National Orders? Well, I have been in the job for about a year, and I find it's a very interesting job. It's a responsibility which is very different from all the other ones I've handled before. We came out recently, uh, the council had to sit and make recommendations to the head of state. So it's a job where I am seeing new things, and I'm learning new things, and I'm adjusting to the circumstances. I am very proud of it because I think uh, I think I will still learn a lot of things there. I'm a learning person who learns. Let me give you one complaint that ordinary Cameroonians give about uh, the uh, Grand Chancellery of National Orders. Some of them think that it should be reformed. And when yes. they talk of reforms, they think that not everybody likes the fact that you have to fill a form requesting for a medal, that there should be a committee that sits, watches people, what they do in this country, and they see that this person has done a marvelous job, they get up one morning and award a medal, because they feel that everybody has his own upbringing, that everybody cannot fill a form to be awarded a medal. Can you see that as a way of reforming? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think we are a young country, and anybody can ask for reforms, and reforms are not a bad thing. Okay. But in that connection, I explain a few things. First of all, not everybody feels a form in order to have a medal. Ah. Uh, there are many ministers, many governors, many SDOs who would propose somebody to be given a medal because of the work of the person. Okay. And that's quite a big number of people. Okay. And even the people who have to fill forms, I am not at the level of the uh, divisional officer nor at the level of the SDO or the level of the governor. But I think they don't just give forms to everybody. They give forms to people who they think merited. I, I would imagine if in Yaoundé you were drunk all the time or you were a criminal, the governor or the SD or the DO wouldn't give you a, a form to fill. So Absolutely. there is already some pre-selection. Okay. Uh, it might not be on paper put that way, uh -huh. but in reality that's what happens. And the president, uh, also gives medals to ambassadors uh, who are going away and gives medals to people who have never filled a form. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you, you used a word that Cameroon is a very complex uh, country and complicated. We need to manage it with a lot of care. We are in the week of national unity. We are celebrating yes. the 49th edition of the National Day. I, I want you to use your experience as a magistrate as a diplomat, you are even an author of a book uh, entitled The Inviolability of uh, uh, Thesis. Yes, yeah, that's my master's thesis. That is your master's thesis. For the uh, LLM in international law, yes. Okay. Why do you think that? It is not only in Cameroon that uh, um, if you go for the, in France, for example, the National Day is celebrated the day a prison was stormed, the past still bombing. That yes. is their national day. It doesn't cause any problem. If you go to the United States, for example, July 4 is not the day the United States gained independence. It is the day they declared independence fought up to 1783 yes. before winning at the Battle of Saratoga where they declared their independence. You may go to the United Kingdom, for example, celebrates the Queen or the King's birthday as their national day. Why do we Cameroonians make May 72? an issue of discourse, of discord, instead of celebrating it as our own coinage of National Day? Well, uh, I, I would say this. We are a diverse country. We are also multicultural. And you don't need everybody to say the same thing and believe the same thing. Uh, it's like religions. Uh, there are always going to be people who will think one thing or the other. Okay. But I think what you should be interested in or what we should retain is not the fake news or the arguments, but the fact that we are a nation. The 20th of May is an important day which was selected after the election or the referendum in uh, uh, 20, no, 20th May 1972. 
And if we decide to celebrate it, that's a good thing for everybody. Okay. It's not a special day in any way, but it's the day when you stop to remember your country, the importance of your country, and then the ambitions of the country. And in passing, I say, uh, we are a democratic nation. In fact, President Paul Bia said this. You don't need to leave this country to express yourself. So you're going to have all these uh, contradictions, people who don't agree or people who agree, people who are not uh, comfortable with certain things. But you will never have everybody agreeing. Go to America, go to Britain, go to France. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. And we live with this. Um, Philemon Young as a family man. Who is he? And what is your best life philosophy? I know that you read a lot, and I didn't want to enter into the subject of reading and books and whatsoever, because yes. it, we can take 10 years just to discuss your knowledge on books and reading. Philemon Young, as a family man, who is he? And what is your life philosophy? Well, I'm a family man, but my life philosophy is very simple. Uh, spend your time serving all the people you can serve. If in serving these people you do good, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> if you don't arrive at doing all the things you want to do, don't be bothered. After you're gone, other people will take over from you. And uh, service to the nation is an important thing because we all here talking freely because people served this nation before. So for me, service to the nation is important. And then by serving the nation, you also serve yourself, you serve your family, and you serve the people who will come after you, even those who are not yet born. The former Prime Minister of Cameroon, Philemo Young, the former Minister, Assistant Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic, the former Cameroon Ambassador, Letter High Commissioner to Canada, the former Minister of Mines and Energy, the former Deputy Minister for Territorial Administration, an ex-student of the Cameroon Protestant College, CPC Bali, CPC Bali and other titles I cannot mention here. Thank you very much for having this conversation with you. And I hope that Cameroonians have learned a lot. But let me just tell you a gossip from ordinary Cameroonians. They told yeah. me that um, there are two characters in Mr. Bia's administration that don't see smile publicly, that you have uh, Philemon Young and Laurent Esso. And I, I, I'm sure that today <laughs> they have seen you smiling and laughing. <laughs> but I smile when it makes sense. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, Your Thank Excellency. You, Thank you very much for talking to us. Keep on watching CRTV. Uh, happy National Day celebration 2021. And always make sure that you respect the barrier measures and gestures against COVID-19 as proscribed by the President of the Republic and implemented by the Prime Minister Head of Government, Joseph Dion Guti. Have a nice Thank time you. with programs on CRTV. Thank, Thank you, sir. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Thank you very much. Thank you.